Okay, we're going to get started. Um, thanks for joining us today uh, on my presentation. We're going to do talk about lagoon rescue. Uh, my lagoon's in trouble. Now, what can I do about it? Uh, talk about some of the different diagnosis and uh, resolutions that um, can be available to you. Um, so the basic structure here is I'm going to give a brief intro into triple point and then a little public service announcements here and there. Um, talk about some of the signs of trouble uh, that lagoons will give you. Uh, and then talk about three different case studies where we've run into some of these troubles uh, and how we kind of did some, took a look at the data, um, understand the situation, did a little testing and came to uh, a solution. Um, and so I hope you find these case studies uh, enjoyable. Uh, these are some of the big, uh, bigger doozies that we've had to deal with over the years, and so I hope uh, they're interesting to you. Finally, just doing a little bit of a recap at the end. So uh, for those of you who maybe uh, are less familiar with Triple Point, we do do a lot of webinars, and since this whole COVID-19 situation has thrust itself upon our country and our world, uh, we have been ramping up our schedule uh, in the hopes that we can give all the engineers uh, in the world all the PDH credits that they need while they're forced to sit at home, uh, and also obviously operator CUs that they need as well. Um, so last week, our uh, esteemed Julie Hartwig gave a presentation on um, lagoon algae and duckweed uh, that was very well attended, uh, very enjoyed by all, by all accounts. Next week, she is giving one on lagoon water chemistry. Uh, so it should be pretty interesting. She always uh, does a fantastic job. So I encourage you to uh, to, to join us. Um, and we'll be doing probably another one the week after that. I don't think we got that topic quite down yet, but uh, keep an eye on your email because that's usually how we get these out to you. Further to that, effort, we have decided and uh, to accelerate our plans to launch what we're calling Laguniversity, um, where we have taken all of our webinar topics and put them onto an online and on-demand platform um, called OnStage, which is actually uh, run by the same people as GoToWebinar. And this allows you to get basically uh, live on-demand uh, PDHs and CEUs. Um, and uh, we're really hoping that this helps everybody, you know, be able to get all the hours that they want, uh, helps them get some good education on lagoons so you can better understand them. Um, and we really see this as our opportunity to kind of give back to the wastewater community, given that all these conferences, you know, have been canceled, unfortunately, just due to obviously social distancing. And uh, we really hope that uh, this everybody sees what well, we see as an opportunity for people to to get more of their credits online this year. Uh, we are seeking approval for continuing education credits for wastewater operators within the states here uh, listed: Missouri, Iowa, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, Arkansas, Maine, and Idaho. Uh, with more to come later on down the road. But if you have a state that you're in and you're an operator or uh, an engineer and you want us to get approval from the regulators, please let us know. Uh, we uh, need to prioritize because we all 50 states, it's a lot of work. Um, so uh, please do reach out to us after this webinar and let us know or put, put, put a question or comment down here uh, and go to webinar so that we know where to go next um, because we obviously want to provide the most value to, to the most people. So we're really excited about this platform. It's available, it's online right now. Uh, laguniversity.com. We're going to be doing some enhancements to it here in the coming weeks, but you should still be able to watch everything. And I think we got 10, 10 hours up there right now. So uh, there'll be more added as we go. Also, for you folks out there that maybe that haven't joined us before, we do have lots of blogs, educational videos, training events. Uh, we have a Facebook community, and we do give away free Lagoons to a Better Hat. So go to lagoons.com forward slash LBIB to get your free hat uh, and sign up to any of those uh, things that might be of interest to you. So a little intro into us, into Triple Point. Um, we are a lagoon-focused company. 
So we focused on providing Lagoon process solutions uh, to help you upgrade a Lagoon, rehab a Lagoon, or to expand a Lagoon. Uh, and so over our 14-year uh, existence, we've kind of uh, actually going right to left, developed uh, technologies to help meet the, the, the needs of Lagoon. So our first technology was the Ares Lagoon Narrator. Uh, formerly known as the Mars Lagoon Aerator. Uh, the Ares unit is actually a design upgrade to the Mars system that we are launching, launched last year. Um, and it's the same technology. I'll talk a little bit about that more later in the presentation. The second is our Nitrox system, which is designed to be implemented within a lagoon to help a lagoon meet an ammonia limit. Um, so regardless of the temperature of the water, um, any time of year. Uh, the third is the total nitrogen, if you ever need to meet total nitrogen. And then the final one is the phosphorus for very low phosphorus limits. Um, so we really feel like, you know, you can keep your lagoon, you can upgrade your lagoon to meet any challenge that you have, uh, whether it's just replacing old aeration uh, to make it more efficient, or whether it's increasing capacity of your lagoon, or whether it's just meeting a more stringent effluent requirement. Uh, we really can help you looking to do it better. So our, you know, what we feel that makes us different as a company are three different things. Uh, first of all, the fact that we only focus on the goods, that our passion, our mission, our motto, our, well, the reason we get out of bed in the morning is to help the do it better. And like anything, you know, we're talking about troubleshooting here, for example. You know, if you have a health problem, Right, and you know it's it's you know related to uh, your heart, or it's just a general health problem. You're going to go see a doctor, and you would like to go see a doctor who's a specialist because the specialist is going to be able to diagnose and solve your problem. Uh, and so, just like that, we really feel like you know we are able to specialize in lagoons and be experts at at that one thing to be an inch wide and a mile deep when it comes to lagoons. We don't do any other wastewater process. So really feel like that gives us a huge advantage. Um, the second thing is we tailor our solution to your lagoon as opposed to trying to give a cookie cutter solution. We really want to use the existing infrastructure. We wanna use the best of what the lagoon has to offer and we wanna provide a solution or, or a process piece of equipment that can you know, remedy any of the issues that lagoons have. So we tailor our solution to your process. And the final thing is we guarantee everything we do. Uh, one of our core values here is we say it, we do it. It's probably the most important core value we have. We just, we, we, we just want to be people of our word. Um, and so we're so sort of hell bent on that that we've actually provided, we actually provide all of our systems with a guarantee that it will do what we say it's gonna do. Uh, that includes a five-year mechanical warranty and a five-year process guarantee uh, for municipal systems. Um, and um, so, you know, we really feel like that's unique and not a lot of people give those kinds of guarantees out as, as blanket as ours are. So, on to the presentation. And the last caveat before I start and get into the material here. Um, I've relied heavily on Steve Harris's book, uh, Wastewater Lagoon Troubleshooting. And I, this is only an hour, and I am scratching the surface of this book, not even scratching the surface, hardly. Uh, I'm in the table of contents <laughs> when it comes to uh, things you can do to diagnose and troubleshoot lagoon issues. I really, if you have lagoon problems, this is a, a book you can get at usabluebook.com. You can also reach out to Steve. Uh, he does consulting. He'll come out to your lagoon and help you do testing and help you to optimize your, the, the, your lagoon system overall. This guy is awesome. He really is. And, and we've hired him to do trainings in the past, and he, he just comes in and gives a fantastic presentation. And this is actually, this is a two-day course that he gives on lagoon troubleshooting and optimization. So uh, I'm scratching the surface here, but I got I to, gotta, you know, I got to hail to the man. And the man is Steve Harris. So uh, if you have more questions after this presentation, certainly feel free to ask us. But this is a good book and good reference guide to have. So 
Now to the material here. Um, do you have lagoon odors, high effluent BUD, TSS, ammonia, phosphorus, uh, sludge islands, floating sludge, unusual lagoon color, algae growth, high coliform, the list goes on. If you have these things, you should ask your doctor about margaritas. Margaritas <laughs> are great. Uh, they come with them. Some side effects, uh, heightened sense of self-esteem, general disregard for problems, uh, also some negative side effects in dehydration, nausea, and possible vomiting. Um, no, I joke. Um, just want to make sure you're all paying attention out there. Um, but um, these are some of the problems that we see, and, and, and it's amazing how common these problems can be when it comes to lagoons. Uh, and when we get these calls, these are usually the things that people are asking us about. Some of the common causes are, generally speaking, it tends to be these things. It tends to be organic overloading, a lack of oxygen, too much sludge, poor mixing, or just generally having insufficient bacterial mass to do the job. Um, and when you look at a lagoon, and, and I sort of uh, was thinking about this presentation, I'm like looking at a lagoon, I'm like, you know, lagoon's kind of interesting. It, it's, you know, just like we as humans have what Victor Maslow, who's a psychologist, uh, suggested was a hierarchy of human needs such as physical needs to have shelter, food, water, uh, to safety, to friendship and love, to respect and self-esteem, to self actualization with the bottom of this pyramid being the most fundamental. And as you move up the pyramid, uh, right, the, the things that become more and more important, the more and more motivated people get and the more and more happy people tend to be when they can achieve that top level of self actualization uh, lagoons are similar, right? They need a, a non-toxic environment so that the bugs can grow, right? They need food so those bugs can grow. They need time, right, so that the bugs have sufficient time to break down that food. Uh, they need mixing. And then at the top of that is they need oxygen. And if you can build all these things up, these building blocks from non-toxicity all the way up to, to oxygen, uh, you can really treat a heck of a lot of waste in a, in a lagoon in an odor-free, low sludge environment, right? And, and um, you know, there are trade-offs there to an extent that, you know, it costs a lot of money to mix an area to lagoon uh, relative to just having a faculty of lagoon, but they're there nonetheless. Um, and so I, I kind of created this... Uh, I had put too much thought into it, so somebody's got a critique, but you know. Um, but um, this gives you kind of a basic building block approach to a really functioning and highly uh, functioning lagoon system. So when we talk about diagnosis of lagoon problems, I think these are the three things that come to mind for me. Uh, first of all, you know, use your senses, your sight, your smell, right? The lagoon is going to communicate to you if there's something wrong with it, right? And, and, and just as I sort of like to think of a lagoon and call me crazy, I like to think of it as a human, like uh, sort of similar to analogous to a human organism. Uh, the lagoon itself is alive. There is bacteria within it that is alive. Uh, and uh, if you use your senses, it'll be telling you something. If you see the water color being off, it'll tell you something. If you smell, odors coming from the lagoon, it'll tell you something, um, et cetera. If you see popping sludge, it'll tell you that there's floating sludge on the surface. It's telling you something about what's going on in it. And as you learn about how to diagnose problems or you learn about lagoon problems and what causes them, you'll start to realize that that communication is actually really telling. The second thing is, you know, look at your data. Um, and it sounds sort of silly, but there's more to the data that it meets the eye, right? The data is telling you stuff in it if you know how to analyze it properly. I'll give you an example. Steve Harris in his book has a whole section on how to look at BOD and TSS ratios. 
So you take your BOD and you take the TSS and you make a ratio of them. And what that ratio can tell you about how your looking uh, is behaving and what might be causing it to behave that way. Um, and so um, that's that's free, man. You've got that data. You had to take it to your discharge requirements. That's free data. You can use that to understand your system. And then finally, do some testing. You know, if you can't figure out what the problem is by using your senses, you can't figure it out by looking at your data, and you need to do some more testing. And a lot of times you do have to do more testing to really nail it down. We'll talk about some of those testing opportunities in this piece. So, first case study. This is up in Michigan. Um, it's the uh, near Lake Odessa. And it doesn't, uh, almost doesn't look like a lagoon from this picture. Um, and it, it, believe me, that is water and that is uh, a lagoon itself. So this facility is actually a municipally owned system that, that receives industrial wastewater uh, from one, uh, one of their main recipients is a, is an egg processing facility. So what had evidently happened here is these uh, high levels of organic loading came into the lagoon and uh, created this really big mat on the surface. You can see there that's the surface aerator sticking down in the water. And the, the, the actual surface aerator in the whole lagoon was uh, encompassed, filled with this sludge mat at the surface. It was about a foot thick. Underneath that mat was water. Uh, down to the bottom where there was some additional sludge. Um, obviously, lots of odors here. Um, uh, lots of floating sludge here, right? And finally, insufficient BOD treatment, right? So, you know, using your senses, you can look at it and say, wow, there's some floating sludge. This smells bad. And looking at the data, you can see that it wasn't doing great uh, BOD removal either. Uh, to put it uh, shortly, uh, it was a lagoon dumpster fire, uh, is really what it was. Uh, it's probably one of the worst lagoons that we've ever seen at the company, uh, and it was really fun to work on this project to help them solve the problem. So why? Why was this happening? So our hypothesis was that the system was overloaded in that the there was clearly insufficient aeration within the lagoon itself for the amount of organic load that it was seeing. Right, and one of the telltale signs of overloading is that you end up getting a nasty odor, right? And the reason you get this nasty odor is because the sludge is breaking down anaerobically on the bottom. And if you have insufficient aeration to handle the load, obviously the oxygen that's going into the water is getting consumed immediately by the BOD consuming bacteria. So the DO levels remain extremely low anaerobic conditions persist, and when anaerobic digestion occurs, you get the production of H2S, hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is obviously a very nasty uh, smell, but what it also does is it actually will build up underneath the sludge blanket on the bottom, and it will float sludge to the surface. So uh, in this case, this particular biosolid was egg protein mainly. And egg proteins seem to bind together quite robustly. Um, and as they do, when they get uh, H2S that builds up underneath them, they'll float a very, very big chunk of this stuff right to the surface of the water where it just sits there. Um, it was really kind of a very curious situation. So, you know, looking at this, looking at the data, understanding the situation, seeing the sludge mat, you know, it, it became clear to the operator that aeration was, aeration and mixing, more aeration and mixing was really probably gonna be a good solution for him. Now, the question is what? Because obviously he has aerators in there. You could see this one right here, right? And he's like, well, these type of aerators aren't working for me, what can I do? So at that point, he, he did give us a call. And so one of the reasons he gave us a call is because he recognized that our, this aerator, our Aries, formerly known as the Mars, uh, uses a combination of fine bubble aeration for efficient oxygen transfer, 
with coarse bubble, uh, static tube, right, which is the center tube uh, right here in the center of the unit. And, and what happens is, as we release that coarse bubble through this tube, it actually helps to circulate water and pull it from the bottom and push it towards the surface. Uh, and as you can see from the CFD model here, it, it, it's pulling water towards it and pushing it towards the surface. It's pulling water towards it and pushing it towards the surface. So it creates a tremendous amount of movement of water and a tremendous amount of mixing um, within the system itself. So he wanted to, uh, the second piece of the unit is that it's, it's very portable. Um, it can be uh, attached. You can put a blower on shore, a blower on shore right here. And we have these different manifold points which have individual airlines which come off of them. Um, and those go out to the aerator. Uh, and then you could take the aerator on the boat and drop it down on the surface. So that made it really easy for him to deploy uh, the units in the water where he could have the blower sitting there and take them out on the boat. So he was really interested in that. So before he went ahead and, you know, decided that this is what he was going to do, um, he, he wanted to test it, right? He wanted to see, he wanted to verify that he could do this. So we actually developed a rental program where we've got rental aeration systems uh, with a blower and some diffusers and you know the benefits are you can get something out there quick You know where he was re seeing really bad odors getting a lot of complaints and the neighbors really needed a solution to, to at least get something get some air in there uh, You also with our systems You have the expertise that we have to be able to say what you need and what you don't need and then finally we also give a credit towards uh, full-scale system should you want it uh, later on down the road. So we've got multiple size systems. We've done this at a number of different locations. Um, this is one here up in actually uh, Idaho uh, at a sugar beet processing facility uh, where they dropped in some units here from the shore. Um, and so, so anyway, so he decides, okay, well, we're going to rent the system. We're going to put it in, see how it works. Um, so they get out there and they're, they're, we're, we're, we're helping them put it in and they decided they're going to rent this crane, right? Because this mat on the surface of the water is so thick that they really, they don't think they can float a boat on it. Right. Or, uh, they don't want to because it's almost like a pool cover. You fall into this thing and you know, you, you ain't coming out, you know? Um, and so they get this big crane that has this really long boom on it so they can get the aerator out there which is totally unnecessary, another, any other application. Um, and they hook up the unit to it, and they just kind of swing it out there. They put it down, and um, sort of unbelievably to everyone, everyone's disbelief, uh, the unit just sits on top of this sludge vat. Um, keep in mind here, this is a 200-pound aerator that's sitting on top of this sludge mat and it is not going in, right? Um, and that's how thick and how dense this sludge mat was. I mean, it was, it, it was, um, it was, it was, it was, it was a joke. Um, so unfortunately, some poor soul uh, had to get out there in a boat. Um, and it, it kind of looks like from this picture, like he's paddling the boat. He's not paddling the boat. Okay, <laughs> you, you, there's no there, there's no paddling that's going on here. I think he was kind of helping, but really what he was being doing is he was getting pulled across the surface of this sludge mat uh, from that rope at the end of the boat uh, that was going to the other shore. And so this guy, he had to get out there, and then he had to literally stand on the Aries unit to get it down underneath the sludge through the sludge blanket i mean I, w I actually was trying to find a camera somebody should have this was uh, when was this this was like 2012 um so i don't know if somebody had a cell phone but they should have popped their cell phone picture of this or take a video of this because this was awesome <laughs> he literally had to stop it down into the water i could i would pay good money to have it eventually they got them all in and they fired them up and within 20 minutes, they started seeing a hole at the surface. And then uh, within 45 minutes, they had this big 
open gap. And they already almost immediately started seeing a dissipation in the amount of odors uh, that were coming from the lagoon, and they started to see a drop in their beauty on the effluent side. Um, so it really, really did help them out. And it, it proved the entire hypothesis that we had had on this system. Uh, eventually, obviously, they put in the full-scale system here. Uh, it's done a fantastic job um, keeping their sludge from not building up on the surface like that, keeping an aerobic environment in which they can't get that anaerobic digestion that causes H2S and the sludge to pop. So, case study two. So this system is down in Missouri. Um, there is a uh, lagoon system with a polishing nitrox reactor. Um, so cell one is here. Uh, then water flows from cell one by gravity to cell two. Then comes out of cell two and flows into a pump station, which then pumps up into the reactor, which is right here. Uh, and then from the reactor, through the polishing cell and out the effluent. So the process is that you're treating BOD through the first two cells and lowering the level of BOD treatment, uh, BOD that's going through those cells, right? You're trying to get the BOD before it goes into the reactor down to 30 milligrams per liter, 30 to 45 milligrams per liter. Then you're going through the pump station up to the nitrox. Uh, the nitrox is designed to polish some of that BOD and it's designed to uh, also just eliminate the ammonia. Uh, and so we're reducing the ammonia through the reactor into the polishing cell just to let some solids settle out and then out the discharge, right? So we fire the system up. It's installed in 2015, gets sort of started late 2015 into 2016. And they start collecting data on the ammonia effluent because it is a ammonia polishing system after all. Right, we want to see that we're getting good ammonia removal, and they start seeing something. They start saying, "Like, wait a second, here, we're seeing right here in March, uh, we're seeing a spike in the effluent here." Now, it was still below or right at their limit of what they're allowed to discharge, uh, which was 2.8 milligrams per liter of ammonia uh, in March, but it was still alarmingly higher than they would have wanted. Um, and so they start asking the question of what is going on here if we have an ammonia treatment system, why is this uh, occurring? So well, what we recommended and what the customer did was use a really important tool. Um, if you cannot tell directly by looking at your data what is going on, what you can do is do what's called intrapond testing. So you could take a sample out of each pond all the way back to the effluent to figure out what's going on in each pond. You can, if you know what the influence of the pond is, you know what the effluence of the pond is, you can look at the BOD, TSF, ammonia, phosphorus, whatever the thing that you want to look at, nitrate, nitrite, and tell, are we seeing reduction here? Are we seeing an increase here? You know, generally speaking, our expectation is that you should be seeing a reduction, a, a gradual reduction of all your main parameters from the front of the plant to the back of the plant, right? Um, and so that's what they did. Uh, they pulled an extra sample right after the reactor, and they already had taken their effluent sample, so they're doing only one extra sample to see what was going on. And this is what we, what we saw over that time period. What we actually saw here and, and what the data suggested was actually the ammonia coming out of the reactor was pretty good. Uh, it was better than what was coming out of the polishing pond pretty much universally, right? So it really, what it indicates is that we have something going on in the polishing pond, right? What's going on in the polishing pond? Why is the polishing pond, right, adding ammonia to the system after the reactor? Right? It's a question that then arises. So we need to do a little bit more investigation to figure out why that is occurring. One thing is that uh, we suspected, and what we know from our own experience, is that uh, obviously as lagoons build up sludge, that sludge can break down anaerobically. We saw that with the Lakewood case study. One of the byproducts of, of anaerobic breakdown 
is that nutrients can get released, right, um, into the water at that point. So give you an example. We work with landfills uh, from time to time. Landfills are um, basically anaerobic digesters is what they are. And, you know, you put a bunch of, to put it very simplistically, you put a bunch of garbage and you bury it, right? It breaks down anaerobically, right? Uh, landfills are actually required to collect that gas, burn it. Um, and they're also, they also have what's called leachate. And leachate is basically when the, when rain lands on the landfill, it soaks through, percolates through the landfill, and then it comes out. And that needs to be collected and treated. Now, it is very difficult to see very high concentrations of ammonia in landfill leachate. And the reason is it's because it's in a rubber digester. Uh, it's just a byproduct of the process. So same thing in lagoons. When you get too much sludge built up in a lagoon, that sludge will start to break down anaerobically if it doesn't have enough oxygen. And that will release ammonia, phosphorus, all sorts of nutrients. So we got out there and we did a sludge measurement. Uh, you can see here, this is Tom, uh, our Northwestern Regional Manager there, who's out there doing a sludge measurement, not on the Hillcrest Lagoon, but on a different lagoon. Um, and if you want more information about how to do a sludge judge or how, how to, to test the sludge adequately in your lagoon, because it is kind of nuanced, um, we do have a really good webinar on that that goes into more detail. Uh, so go see Lagoon University. So this shows you here, uh, one of the aspects of this is that you're setting up a grid uh, and you are actually doing multiple different sludge testing points. This is actually cell one at Hillcrest. This is the polishing cell here at Hillcrest. And what we found in this sludge testing was that they had quite a bit of sludge within their polishing cell. Um, and now, while all that sludge isn't necessarily organic or volatile, meaning not all of that sludge is going to break down anaerobically, some of it's going to be sand and grit and non-volatile components, uh, usually about 50% of it will break down anaerobically. So that 50% is essentially fuel uh, that we're trying, that we need to get rid of somehow uh, to stop that ammonia rebound from occurring. In this case, I mean, it was quite actually interesting. There's some spots where we had four feet of sludge, two and a half feet, three feet, uh, right over here in this table here. So we like to use sludge, that's, you know, sludge surveying. This is such a key component of any, is such a key diagnostic tool when you're trying to figure out what's going on with a lagoon. You know, a lot of times sludge is the big issue, right? And uh, I would say lagoons are awesome. I love them. Um, and, but if there's one Achilles heel of a lagoon, it's sludge, right? And while on the one hand, it's like a huge advantage that you don't have to remove or handle biosolids on a regular basis, uh, which is why lagoons are really low maintenance. On the other hand, if you don't manage your sludge, that's when you start to see problems, right? And sludge judging is a key, key, key management tool for understanding how much sludge you have and when you should remove it. You know, compounding that sludge is duckweed. So this is actually a picture of the uh, of the duckweed mat that was on the surface of the lagoon there, the polishing lagoon at Hillcrest. And uh, this is actually taken with a drone. Uh, I wasn't standing in the lagoon with my cell phone, which I could have gotten this angle if I did, but I wasn't that crazy. Um, and the problem with duckweed is, and if you were listening to uh, Julie's webinar last week, is that duckweed will actually, when it forms and it grows on the surface of the water, it will um, it will soak nutrients into it, into itself, into into its own composition. Right? It'll pull phosphorus, it'll pull ammonia, nitrogen right into it. Right? Which is awesome on one level. Right? I mean, if you could remove that duckweed at that point, which you can. Um, you know, you can then use it for, it's a great fertilizer, right? Uh, to so be used elsewhere because it's got such you know, nutrients in it. But, but if you don't remove it, it pulls the nutrients, it grows, it creates this big mat, then it dies off. And then that biomass then gets sinks down to the bottom. So when that biomass sits on the bottom, 
it starts to break down anaerobically, and that's when you see a re-release of that ammonia that it's sucked into its cell wall. So that really compounds, right, this um, this sludge buildup, and it really compounds this rebound effect that you tend to see within the polishing cell itself. Um, and, and that's exactly what they were seeing here at Hillcrest, because they had a lot of duckweed. So what's the solution? So we came up with a three-part solution. Uh, and we were kind of in George Foreman mode on this one. We weren't going to try one thing and then see if it worked and then try something else. But we were just like, no, we're going to knock this one out and we're going to knock it out quick, right? First thing we did was we put in a recirculation pump. Recirculation is a great tool. It can be deployed really cost effectively. You can go buy a pond pump, plop it in the effluent chamber as they did here and then pump water from the back of the lagoon to the front of the nitrox or from the back of the, the polishing cell to the front of the first cell. And, you know, nine times out of 10, you put a recirculation pump in and you improve treatment through the whole system by about 30%. And what you're doing is you're just giving everything a second pass through the system. And it really helps to improve the level of treatment that you get out of it. Um, so that was the first thing. Second thing we did was we put an aerator in the polishing cell. Luckily, we had a blower sitting there for our nitrox system. So all we had to do was just siphon some air off that blower and plop this aerator in. And we had it in in a matter of days. Really easy. Um, the beauty of the aerator is it does a couple things, right? First of all, it mixes the water, right? That mixing helps to bring oxygen down to the lower echelon, right? Um, it adds oxygen in addition to that. And so what it does is it creates more of an aerobic environment versus an anaerobic environment. And we're stopping that anaerobic digestion from occurring, which is causing the release of those nutrients. And the benefit of mixing, finally, is that it discourages, out, uh, it discourages duckweed growth. It doesn't stop it. Duckweed's tough. You're not going to mess with duckweed. I mean, it's, it's duckweed, algae, all those aquatic plants are tough. But it keeps a hole open. Uh, within the actual lagoon itself. And that helps to sort of just stop the duckweed mat from getting too thick. Um, so you can see here, this is a picture that I took uh, from the side of the lagoon looking up at the nitrox there. And you can see it creates this nice little hole and it really does help to keep the duckweed down uh, in addition to raising the yield. And the third thing we did was we actually added additional bacteria, sludge eating bacteria, to, to break down that sludge in place. Um, and so based on our measurements of where the sludge was within this lagoon, we chose these three different locations that we wanted to put the, the bacteria in, uh, four actually, including the effluent. And we supplied uh, some sludge reducer to the owner and it comes in these water soluble bags. So you just have the bucket sitting there and you take the bag out and you throw it to the approximately to locate those four different locations. Um, and that helps to just kind of, it just helps to speed up the breakdown of that sludge on the bottom, uh, in addition to having the aeration and the recirculation in there. Um, it just kind of just, again, puts it on steroids a little bit so that we can get that, that fuel that's, that's sitting down there, that's breaking down anaerobic, anaerobically and causing the ammonia to, to, to be spent faster. And what we saw here was we just saw, um, you know, the ammonia just drop off a cliff, really. I mean, this is, two, this is 2017 by the time this is just one year, but this is January in the winter. So, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're about two right here in ammonia and that we don't think that that has anything to do with the rebound at all. That's just the reactor. Uh, gets a little bit colder, the bugs slow down a little bit, but it was totally fine. Uh, and then it came down pretty quickly over the summer months. And then, you know, this is under 0.6 right here, 0.55. So very, very low in the summer months and then uh, then through. So we, um, I mean, we've never actually had a problem meeting permit at this particular site. But um, these this shows you how stringent the limits can be. And in, in Missouri, they have this 0.6 and 2.1 long run limit. And we're able to easily hit those limits uh, and be able to re rehab that polishing cell. So the final case study that I want to share with you 
Um, this facility um, is up in uh, British Columbia, up in the mountains. Uh, this has to be one of the most picturesque lagoons that I've ever been to. Uh, and a lot of lagoons are very picturesque, by the way. Um, but this one, definitely. And so what they were doing here was they had um, uh, an old aeration system in their lagoon. They had to reline their lagoon. They had to remove sludge. And they were going to, well, and they had to re replace their aeration system. Um, so if you look at this, this is actually their cell one. Uh, and then they have this big cell two. And then they had their final polishing cell right here. Uh, then it went out. Uh, they also had existing blowers right here. Uh, and they kind of retrofitted the header to those existing blowers and then had uh, their air laterals in this case for this lagoon and individual airlines for each aerator in this lagoon. So, you know, they did the project. Um, they desludged it. Uh, they put the new aeration system in, we came out, we gave our blessing, you know, um, everything's running, everybody's happy, you know, uh, and then, uh, I don't know, maybe a month later, two months later, engineer, you know, gives me a call and he's like, hey, you know, we're seeing really low dissolved oxygen in this first cell. And we don't really understand what's going on. I mean, the rest of our cells look pretty good, but the first cell we're kind of measuring you know, under almost near zero dissolved oxygen coming out of it. What's going on? Um, and he says, you know, the operator reported that it kind of smelled a little musty, you know, out there standing on the berm. Um, so, you know, the first thought everybody thought is, oh, the aeration's not working. There's something wrong with the diffusers. You know, it's a new system. There's no way it should be behaving this way. You know, lots of these kinds of concerns start to pop up on top of your head. Uh, believe it or not, usually it's never that simple. Uh, when you're diagnosing lagoon problems, the first uh, problem doesn't tend to be the one that you think it is uh, when it comes up, but you have to do a little bit more digging to figure it out. So, you know, there are a number of possibilities when you're talking about low dissolved oxygen. And the first set of things that you need to look at are um, you know, are the blowers putting out enough air, right? Or putting out too much air, because putting out too much air can be inefficient from an operational perspective versus not putting out enough, which is just not supplying enough of the volume. Uh, are they measuring the O properly? Is the probe calibrated, right? Is it being measured in the right place? Uh, and third thing is, yeah, is there damage to the diffusers? You know, this is a new system, so that didn't seem, that wasn't likely. And we'd seen it as they were installing it, so we felt good that it was installed and the diffusers were, were fine and assembled correctly. But in other looking facilities where we've seen low DO, uh, like up here, this is actually an old system that was pulled out and replaced with an area system. And you can see here that these diffusers are just ragged up like crazy. You know, and it, they just, they were having a hard time getting DO in there. And when you have a hard time getting DO in there, you have, a, you have a, typically a lot of lagoon odor, uh, that occurs, you know, as we saw with the liquid, uh, case study earlier. Um, so in this case, you know, we verified the blower the best we could, looked like it was putting out enough air. The DO probe was calibrated, you know, they felt like it was adequate, uh, and adequately reading. And we knew the diffusers weren't damaged because they were just installed. So then you start to think about, well, where can the DO go, right? Where does the dissolved oxygen, where does the oxygen go once it gets in the water, right? We're pulling an ambient, ambient air in, we're pushing it down to the bottom of the lagoon. Where's it going? So there's three pathways, right? It's either consumed by the bugs, right? There's good biology in there that's eating food, right, which is then consuming dissolved oxygen, exactly what we want it to do, right? But if you have existing sludge, or if you have, if you're seeing more loading than the system was designed for, you will have persistently low DO, right? Because sludge can be undigested BOD, uh, and obviously high influent BOD can suck down oxygen levels pretty quickly. The second, is it can go to dissolved oxygen, right? 
So let's say you have a low loading condition, right? Then all that oxygen that's coming in, you're going to run a really high DO, right? Because it's just dissolving in the water and there ain't no bugs consuming it, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, the third pathway is it goes into the atmosphere, right? The air is just not transferring the water. For some reason, it's not getting in the water. The oxygen's not getting in the water. The bubbles are too big, you know, and so they're really inefficient. Uh, you've got a lot of fat, oil, and greases in the water that are, you know, that are causing the there to be, uh, like, basically, you can get a phenomenon where oils and greases will actually build up on the outside of the bubble as it's rising through the water column and just stop, inhibit it, create a physical barrier that inhibits the oxygen transfer of that bubble. And the third thing is air, like you're pulling in dirty air. If you don't have a lot of oxygen in the air you're pulling into your blower, then you're not going to be able to diffuse a lot of oxygen into the air, right? So, I mean, these are the three pathways. You've got to kind of narrow down what's going on here. So, so we looked at a couple of different things that we thought that was probably the case after we looked at all these different factors. One thing was we felt like maybe, you know, it was a little bit of overloading. Maybe there was a lot of BOD coming in. And, you know, they didn't have any good influent BOD measurements. The trouble with measuring influent BOD is that in order to do it, you need a 24-hour composite sampler because a grab sample is typically not accurate. Uh, and the reason a grab sample is not accurate is because your flow does not come into the system uh, evenly throughout the day. You know, if you have a municipal system, it typically comes in the morning and the evening, right? And um, mainly in the morning and then a little bit in the evening. Um, and so if you're pulling a sample, depending on what time of day you pull that sample, you're not going to get an accurate representation. Uh, if you use a composite sampler, you're going to get a more accurate representation. Um, so we didn't have composite sampling data. And they also had an industry in town, but they didn't have a, a, an agreement to do any testing on what the industry was giving them. So there was just this kind of unknown loading that the industry was giving them, and potentially an unknown um, surfactant, like fat oil and grease or something that was preventing our system from transferring the oxygen to water. So that was one thing. The second thing was, uh, we were not entirely convinced that the way they were measuring DO was accurate, that they were doing it in the right way. And I'll explain that in a minute. So first, the high uh, BOD loading. We couldn't verify the industry. They didn't have a composite sampler to test the influent BOD. So I sort of started thinking. And, and at some point, the light bulb went off. And I'm like, well, how did they fill this lagoon up? You know, how did they do the desludging? So I talked to the contractor and I gave him a call and I said, hey, Chris, how did you do this? You know, you obviously couldn't take the system offline when you were installing our system. How did you do it? And the way he did it was he actually started by cleaning cell two, desludging cell two. And then once he had that done, he filled up cell two with water from these two cells, let the aeration run, and then bypass cell one. Right, so cell two had all this water in it. They were treating through cell one and what, cell two only for about six months before they started up cell, cell one again. And actually, they were getting, they were meeting their effluent requirements with just one cell in operation in cell two, which would made it even more baffling, right, as to why they were having DO issues in cell one if they were able to do it, have higher DO in cell two with all the same flow and loading that cell one was getting when it, when it, when it was started up. And then I said, well, Chris, if when you went to go fill cell one, how did you do that? Where'd you get the water from? And well, he's like, well, I just let it flow in from the influent. Okay. Well, that kind of makes sense that you would do that. But then I started thinking of, well, wait a second here. That is, that is an instantaneous loading on the system, right? That is getting a lot of pounds per day of loading coming in from the collection system at one time. Because when that water fills up the lagoon, it's about 4,000 pounds a day, right? And if the lagoon is a million gallons, that means it's getting 8,000 pounds over the course of a very short period of time. Uh, so it's got to be able to treat that loading that came in, right, which it's not treating initially because it doesn't have the biomass to treat it initially, plus the flow that's coming in every single day, right? 
So there was a lot of loading coming in. That was one thing. So it was temporarily overloaded uh, is essentially what it was. And number two was because it was just desludged, chances are it didn't have the biomass to treat that level of BOD coming in immediately. It didn't have the bucks. There was no bucks. He scraped that would be clean, right? He removed all the bucks. So now you got to grow the bugs again. And when you're growing bugs, it can take time to build them in sufficient numbers, right, in order to treat the waste entirely. So that was the conclusion that I was thinking about. That was what I was thinking about. Like, hey, man, this could take six months. Like this, you know, if you think about it, they have to chop through that initial 8,000 pounds plus the 4,000 pounds they're getting per day. Like that's not just going to happen overnight. You know, it's like any wastewater system. When you start it up from scratch, it doesn't, you can't just flick the switch and all of a sudden it starts treating the wastewater right away. Um, so that was a hypothesis that I'd come to. And eventually, you know, we also decided to get out there as we were, as I came up with that hypothesis, I decided to get out there. We started, decided to do a DO survey, dissolved oxygen survey. So the thing about dissolved oxygen in a lagoon is because lagoons are only partial mix, um, you don't necessarily have universal dissolved oxygen throughout the lagoon. There could be spots both vertically within the water column here from the top to the bottom and horizontally across it, right? Uh, this, loca this location versus that location. You would expect, for example, the influent side of the lagoon to have lower dissolved oxygen versus the effluent side of the lagoon because obviously the influent side is seeing more BOD. And so where do you take your sample, right? And so the city was taking their sample on the back end at the effluent of the lagoon. And I wasn't convinced that was gonna be representative, right? So I got out there in a boat, me personally. We chose several different dissolved oxygen points and we went down and we went two feet, four feet, six feet, eight feet, 12 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet, took dissolved oxygen measurements all across the lagoon to different locations, different depths, to try and see if there's any difference there. And what was interesting was two things. First of all, there wasn't as much difference as I thought, which sort of flies in the face of logic, because if it's partial mix, then you would see, think there would be a difference. Um, and the second thing was that it was actually fairly homogenous from the perspective of everywhere pretty much had the same DO, which I think speaks to the really effective mixing that the ARIES technology utilize, you know, is able to achieve. Um, so it really surprised me, actually. And as you can see here, the DO also was a lot higher at this point. So by the time I got out there, which was maybe six months after the low dissolved oxygen they were seeing, they're right up into the threes and fours where they wanted to be in terms of dissolved oxygen. So the problem was kind of already solved. Uh, and so this was kind of a uh, non-solution in a certain sense because we didn't actually solve the problem. We did it by just waiting long enough and then doing accurate measurements. Um, but the idea behind using dissolved oxygen is really important as a diagnostic tool. You just have to realize that um, you can't just put pick one spot in the lagoon and that's your dissolved oxygen. That's not going to necessarily be representative. It's the best thing to do is get in a boat, get out within the lagoon, look at several different points, and use different depths. So just a, a recap of some of the diagnostic tools that I've you know mentioned in this um, in this webinar. You know, look at your data regularly, use your senses, do intrapond testing if you have to, DO survey, sludge survey, and yeah, get Steve Harris's book or go to a two-day class, which we offer because he is awesome. You know, he's really the man. Um, finally, before I end here and open up the questions, I just wanted to mention that we also rent, in addition to renting aeration systems, which can be a really good uh, way to get you over a short-term need or a short-term problem. We also have our mobile nitrox system, which is essentially a mobile tanker uh, that is a moving bed biofilm reactor um, that you can roll, we can roll up, uh, you know, plug and play, get up and going and help you treat BOD, ammonia, different things like that. Uh, this picture here is actually of an industrial site where we did this a couple of years ago. Uh, where we set, we rented them a two tank system and helped them get rid of ammonia and nitrate. Um, and we were, we're very open for this. We're trying to push this concept because we've seen a very uh, acute demand for this. Um, 
more recently in the last couple of years. Um, so if you have an interest, please do give us a call or you know make a comment at the end of this, and we'll be happy to take a look at the system for you. So with that, uh, I will open up for questions. There's a questions box within your um, um, within the uh, go to webinar uh, sidebar there. Uh, if you want to type any questions in there, I will do my best to answer them. Yes, our systems are available outside the U.S. We do work across uh, North America. The Steve Harris book is available on um, is available on USA Blue Book. Uh, here, I'll leave it up on the screen. It's called the Wastewater Lagoon Troubleshooting. I'll leave that up for you. There's the full title. Do we ever use uh, wastewater microbiology as an indicator? We actually have not done that, although we have bought a microscope. Um, and so we are developing that capability as we speak. Um, we've also used outside labs to help us identify. Uh, typically, we don't get to that level of microbiology uh, where we want to analyze the kind of bugs that are growing until it's real bad, you know, until it's like, man, we can't figure this out. Then we'll go to that level and figure out. But we have done it on a few occasions, actually, uh, in the past. Usually, we don't have to go that far. The AIRS unit is, somebody's asking about the materials construction. It's actually, uh, glass-filled polypropylene. Um, pretty much everywhere, there's a few stainless steel clamps and such, um, but it's a very, very hard plastic. It's actually fairly standard material used in diffuser construction industry. Uh, very good for chemical resistance uh, and very strong. Someone was asking about um, whether um, it, she, that they have seen in activated sludge systems where uh, if they have where they have sufficient dissolved oxygen but are still not seeing uh, any nitrification within the system. Um, and, and do we see that in lagoons? Uh, we we can see that in lagoons. So one of the things that's important with when it comes to nitrification is that you need alkalinity. And um, so the only, yeah, the only thing I'll say about this is you need alkalinity and you need a, a certain amount of alkalinity for every pound of ammonia that you want to remove. Um, so a good example of where you can typically be alkalinity deficient is if you have very soft water in your area um, or if let's say like landfill leachate, for example, is very, tends to be ten, very low in alkalinity and very high in ammonia. And so they typically do not have any alkalinity or sufficient alkalinity to treat all the ammonia they want to treat, in which case you have to add it. So in the case of the uh, mobile nitrox system that we rented to that industry a couple of years ago, that was exactly it. They did not have sufficient alkalinity, so we actually had to provide them with a system that would feed alkalinity into the nitrification reactor uh, through the use of calcium carbonate uh, in order to get them to actually be able to nitrify. Somebody's asking about foaming issues. Um, we have, typically in lagoons, you do, like an actual lagoon, you don't see foaming issues, but we have seen foaming issues in our reactors. Um, foaming, in most cases that we have experienced, it is, is a result of growth of new bacteria. Uh, and this can result typically on the startup of a nitrox reactor system, we see foaming, where we're growing a lot of new bugs that, that didn't exist before or when we see seasonal fluctuations, for example, uh, where we're 
not treating any ammonia in the summertime because the lagoon treats ammonia in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, as it gets colder and colder, the lagoon starts giving the reactor more and more ammonia to treat, and then we see a lot of foaming. So um, that typically, it's sort of one of those things that you can kind of manage, but you don't have to necessarily do much about. It's, just, it's not that bad uh, where it becomes a major uh, issue. Uh, but that's where we've seen it the most, is mainly just new bug growth. How much recirculation is enough? Uh, was one question I have here. So recirculation, um, typically I do two times the flow rate of the system. Is typically what I'll recirculate, recommend, um, or e either 1x or 2x flow is really what it comes down to. Um, and you'll see, you'll see it start doing some damage for you. I mean, not damage, do it, doing some help, helping you out. Uh, I think 2x is better than 1x uh, is typically what we see. Um, with that, I'm going to end the webinar because it's, we're hitting two o'clock here. Uh, we do see all your questions. If you do have more questions, plop them in here, and um, we will get them answered for you. Uh, we're really diligent about trying to get back to people in terms of answering questions. Uh, I thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got ideas for future webinars, please do let us know uh, in the comments. Please fill out the survey at the end because it helps us to do a better job on these webinars going forward. And, um, you know, join us next week. Um, and if you have any needs, aeration, nitrification, whether it's rental or non-rental or whatever, just let us know. We're happy to help in any way we can. Even if it's something we can't sell you, we want you to reach out to us because we like to help and we want to help students do it better. That's, that's, that's the reason we exist. Um, so thank you very much, and I hope you all enjoyed it, and I will speak to you all hopefully maybe at some point in the future. Uh, stay healthy.